think that's enough spiritual food for God's family. The average believer spends less than a minute in prayer a day and very little Bible study. So how are you going to grow unless your soul is fed? And in my opinion, one service a week is not enough. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night is what we do here. We believe it's important. We believe the Bible says to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And that's a great song for us today. Turn to Mark 10 in your Bible. Mark chapter 10 in your Bible. Now, our <clears throat> men, as I said, the Deacons Fellowship meet at 5.30 today in the conference room, uh, finalize the budget for the coming year. Uh, January the 16th on Sunday evening will be our annual church conference. And uh, please keep that in your thinking and in your mind, uh, if you will, please. But tonight at 6 o'clock, the ladies and men meet for prayer. And then at 6.30 the evening service. We'll try to finish up in Revelation 7. That's where we're studying now on Sunday evening through the book of Revelation. And we're in chapter 7. Who will be saved during the tribulation? And then next week we'll go to chapter 8 and the seven trumpets will begin to sound. But before they sound, heaven is silent. Can you imagine no music in heaven? Can you imagine no praising in heaven? Heaven is silent for a space, for a period of time. Why? Well, we'll take a look at that when we get there. I have noticed a great exodus this morning to the balcony. I see Rick up there. Rick is there because he always wanted to look down on me, but uh, I just noticed a great exodus to the balcony, so maybe we'll look up this way a little bit more today. I want to take this time to say for my wife and I to the church family, thank you for all the gifts and the cards. And uh, I've never had so many snacks in all of my life. Um, my doctor loves to give this spiel. I don't go to him often. So when he gets there, he tries to fill everything in. He said, now remember, your stomach is about as big as your fist, about like that. And he said, now, it never eat any more than that. Now, how many of you do that? Huh? <laughs> how many of you will do that today? You'll go up to wherever and you'll, you'll do more than that, won't you? But he said, that's it. Don't do any more than that. Well, I've got enough to last me for three or three years, uh, if that's the case. And I just want to say thank you. And uh, I want to say to Steve Tyson, uh, he gave me a belated Christmas gift this morning. Right, the right color, the right size. Thanks, Steve. Uh, you surprised me. All right. Now, in Mark chapter 10, we'll begin reading in verse 17 and read down through verse 31. He lacked one thing. He lacked one thing. Verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeling to him, and ask him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may have, or I may inter inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. I wish that could be said of young people today. Amen? I think a lot of us who have lived a long time would like to say, I wish I had observed that. Uh, that had been a good thing for our country, wouldn't it? And a good thing for our family if we could say that. But that young man said, uh, that's what I've done. I've kept these things from my youth. Verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around about, and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches 
to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking up on them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all, and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sister, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel's, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many are first shall be last and the last first. Now look at verse 21 again. Then Jesus beholding him loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. If you'll study Mark chapter 10 closely, you'll find that this chapter is a chapter of questions. For instance, in verses 1 through 16, really there is a question being asked, how far can I go? Now God had already spoken very plainly about marriage and divorce. Very plainly. The Old Testament was very plain. God was very plain in what he said. One thing man, one woman. Not two men, not two women, but one man, one woman, forever. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, is that plain enough? It's very plain. But yet, because of the hardness of men's hearts, God gave some added advice. And here are these men coming along and trying to add to it and put their own words to it, and trying to say, well now, um, uh, God said this, but just how close can I get to that, and still be alright with God, and still have His blessings upon me? Now God's a God of grace. There is absolutely no doubt about that. As a matter of fact, in judgment, God remembers mercy. In wrath, God remembers mercy. And you and I will see next to Sunday evening, God willing, in chapter 8, that before the second set of great judgments comes upon the earth, where one-third of the vegetation and one-third of the land masses and one-third of the sea and one-third of the rivers uh, are absolutely uh, filled with evil and violence, before all of that takes place, God pauses to extend a little more time of grace and a little more time of mercy. And I love that about our God. And I thank God that He is a God of grace. But um, why question Him? And why try to come up as close to what He has said without uh, sinning? Why do that? Why don't just you obey Him? Amen? But yet they're trying to say, how far can I go? In verses 28 through verse 45, really there's another set of questions. And that's this, how much will I get? You know, the question seems to be asked today again and again is, what am I going to get out of this? How many times do you hear someone say, what can I give? How many times do you hear someone say, what can I do for you? What can I do for the Lord? What can I do for this church? Usually, when people are looking for a church, the first thing they ask is, what will this church do for me? But the first question you ought to ask is, what can I do for this church? Has God led me here? Do I have the gifts? Do I have the talents that God has, is looking for that this church needs? And then, of course, from that I will receive from the hand of God the great blessings in my life upon this, upon this church. Now, I do understand that the Lord did not rebuke Peter. Peter asked the question. He said, Lord, we've, we've left uh, everything. Now, isn't that amazing? That this man could speak up and make such a comment. Look at verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. We have left all and followed thee. Now, Gary and Debbie is here this morning. They've already been to the Philippines as a missionary. Now they're praying about going to a very, probably one of the most difficult areas of the world to minister. How many of us 
would do that if that was the will of God? How many people in this world would do that if that was the will of God for them? I have missionary friends in China. It's a dangerous place to be in many areas and any kind of witnessing and, and worshiping and, and so forth. There's a, there's a danger to it, uh, they tell me. But these, this couple that I know in China, the Andersons, have made this same commitment. They've said uh, to the Lord, they've said to the world, we're willing to do it. We will leave all to follow you. Brother Arvin uh, Dixon was coming, coming to me this morning and was talking about uh, a missionary that he wanted to get the biography of David Livingston and they couldn't find it. And I know that BIMI has it and I've ordered it for him. I have stood in the little room, the little home of, of David Livingston just outside of Glasgow, Scotland. The bed that he slept in is still there. The chairs and the table in his dining room are still there. Uh, many of his own, uh, the paraphernalia that belonged to him is still there. And he made the commitment, we'll leave all. I've left all to follow thee. And notice what happened. The Lord did not rebuke uh, Peter. But look at verse 29. And Jesus answered. He gave Peter an answer, not a rebuke. Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake, and the gospels. Now wait a minute. You don't leave everything for the glory. You don't leave everything for the prestige. There's a lot of Christians who sing for themselves. There's a lot of Christians who preach for themselves. There's a lot of Christians who serve for themselves. It's not for Christ and the gospel. It's for themselves. The ministry to a lot of men is a business. I've talked to some of them. It's a business. As a matter of fact, it was not too long ago until I talked to a young man and the whole tenor of our conversation was, how is this going to affect me? Am I going to be able to have this? Is it going to be a good package? And usually what happens is, is when a young man calls me for a recommendation or calls me and, and he knows that I know a church that is looking for a pastor, usually the first question out of his mouth is this, what kind of package do they offer? And a wise preacher will know that he didn't take a church because of a package. He accepts the call because it's God's call and because it's the will of God regardless of what's going to take place with him because he's leaving everything to follow the Lord. And so maybe you're here this morning, that's the question you're asked. What am I going to get out of this? Well, would you sing in the choir? Well, what am I going to get out of it? Will I teach a Sunday school class? What am I going to get out of it? And then here in verses 17 through verse 27, another question from a young man. How much can I keep? How much can I keep? Now I want you to think about this young man. Here is the only one who came to Jesus who went away worse than when he came. Now think about that for a moment. Here is a young man who came to Jesus. Every other man, every other woman who came to Jesus went away better. But this man went away worse than he did when he came. Now why? Because he had a superficial view of spiritual things. Here's his question. What good thing can I do? And that's the idea today among the religions of the world. That's the idea today among many people. What good thing can I do? You see, grace just rubs against human nature. Grace agitates human nature. You mean there's nothing I can do? You mean I have nothing to do with it? It's all of God? It can't be, but I've got news for you. It is all of God. Amen. You take away sovereign grace and you don't have a salvation. And you don't have everlasting life. And you have nothing unless you can look up to God and say it's all of you. I didn't choose him. He chose me. I sure I'm glad that he did, but there was nothing in me uh, that brought his attention except for the fact that he loved me and he loves you. And if you're here this morning and you're saved by God's grace, go into 19, or 2005 and say, thank God for your marvelous grace. 
By the way, where would you be today if it were not for the grace of God? Some of you have come from destroyed marriages and God has taken you away. There are people that I know in my former churches and even some in this church that God brought them away from an awful, terrible marriage. And now they're, they're, they're blessed of God. I could tell you the story of a young lady right now in Charleston, South Carolina who lived for years and on Friday night and Saturday night the thing that she had to look forward to was a beating from her husband coming home drunk and she stayed with him because of the kids and then he was a mean, awful man and through God's marvelous grace he delivered her from that and, and now she has a wonderful home and her children are taken care of and she's taken care of because of God's grace. We have a lot to thank God for because of His grace. And some of you say, well, preacher, that never happened to me. I've had a good marriage. I've had a good life. It's still of God's grace. It's still of His grace. And so this young man had a superficial view of spiritual things. What good thing? He had a superficial view of Jesus Christ, good master. And Jesus wanted to remind him, young man, there is none good but God. And, I, and you need to see that I am God. I'm not just a good teacher. I'm not just a good person, a loving person that goes about healing the sick, that goes about doing good. I am God. And if you cannot see that and understand that and understand that there's only one way to heaven and that's through my life, my death, my burial, my resurrection, there is no way to heaven. And he had to see exactly who Jesus was. I was flipping the channels uh, during uh, the Christmas uh, time. And there was a program, and the title of the program was In Search of Jesus Christ. Well, they were looking in the wrong places. They didn't look to the Bible. They looked to history. They looked at culture. They looked at religion. They looked at every avenue but the place where they would have really found Him in the Word of God. And I'm going to say to you this morning, He is God. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not anyone else. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Some of you young people are sitting here this morning and you're dilly-dallying and you're playing around with some of the world religions. You better be careful. You better leave it alone. Their bones are rotting away now. And Jesus is alive, thank God, and in heaven right now where he intercedes for you and intercedes for me. And this young man uh, went away worse than he did when he came to Jesus because he didn't understand spiritual things. He didn't understand the things of Jesus Christ. And he had a superficial view of the law of God. Here's what he said to Jesus and said truthfully probably, Master, all of these things I've kept from my youth up. But you see, eternal life is not obtained through doing things. Eternal life is not obtained through the law. The law could not change anyone, you see. Salvation doesn't come from the outside. It comes from the inside. Salvation is a change on the inside that results in a change on the outside. And this young man came looking, but he could not find because he had a superficial view of spiritual things. You see, he's dealing with external attitudes, not in, or in, external actions, not internal attitudes. I don't have time this morning, but you could go to Matthew chapter 5 and read all the way through and see how grace changes a man from the inside, not from the outside. Now, what was the one thing he lacked? Faith in the living God. I wonder if you're here this morning and you believe in religion. Oh, you believe in God. But Jesus is not in your heart. He's not your Savior. I remind you again of what he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now let's quickly outline this portion of Scripture this morning and then we'll go our way. I want to point out three things. One, look at verse 17. And notice the man and his desire. The man and his desire in verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, 
What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What's your desire this morning? I would look at this young man and there's a lot of things that I could say about him. I, probably a lot of good things that I could say about him. But what was his real desire? There was a superficial layer on the outside and Jesus knew that and understood that and he got to the truth. By the way, Jesus had a way of getting to the truth. If you'll listen to this, Jesus never turned anyone away who was serious. He never turned anyone away who was honestly seeking. But he had a way of getting to the heart of the matter. He had a way of getting to the heart of a man, the soul of a man. So here's the man and his desire. Notice now the person who came. First of all, he had youth. What a great thing this would have been had he accepted the Lord in his youth. By the way, young people, there is no record that this young man ever received Christ. And I will tell you this, the statistics are, uh, are right out before us that most people who are saved are saved early in life. You get up into the 30s and the 40s, the percentage is lessened. You get up into the 50s and 60s, they lessen much more. And then you get up above that and very few people are born again. Why? Because humankind, as we get set in our ways... And the cords of sin tighten around us. The danger. And he came to the Lord in his youth. One man said this. Don't burn the candle of the devil and blow the smoke of a wasted life in God's face. For years I was a youth director. I know a little bit about working with young people. And I know a little bit about young people. I know a little bit about them. I know they want you to be honest with them. And I know that young people can spot a fake a mile away. And I know that they don't want to be lied to. And I know that young people are willing to take the truth even if it's very hard and very difficult. I understand all of that. And you can't play games with young people. And I trust that Brother Claiborne and our school, when they bring speakers to preach from this platform, will not come in here and have someone to rap with our teenagers. They need preaching. And they need solid preaching. And they need someone to lay it on the line. Because young people need that. And I know full well enough that young people can play games. I'll never forget, I just answered the call to preach at age 17. We had a great youth group at our church. And I was always looking uh, for places to go to build my spiritual life. I knew the young people in our area. I knew them well. And I remember hearing about a youth revival in Dayton, which is a few miles from us. And I said, I'm going to take that youth revival. I'm going to take it in. Maybe there's something for me. And I went in and I sat on the back row and I looked around the congregation. There's a large church in the city. And I looked around and I knew most of the young people there. I knew them. There was preacher's sons there and so forth. I knew them. I knew how they lived too. I knew what they bragged about when mom and dad wasn't around. I knew what they bragged about when the preacher wasn't around. I knew. I was one of them. I mean, I, I saw them. I was there. I, went to, I was at ball games and, and different places. I saw it. And they had a guy get up and say some words. And I, I thought to myself, this is meaningless. I think I'm going to leave. And I said, no, I'll stick it out. I'll stay through the end of the service. I'm not going to do that. And when the invitation was given, every young person went forward and kneeled at the altar in front of that speaker and made the statement after it was all over, they stood up and made the statement that from that time forward they were sold out to the Lord. Well, you know what I know as a young man at that time? I know that as soon as that service was over, they went right back to doing what they'd always done. There was no change whatsoever. They did it for mom and dad. To keep mom and dad over here off to the left. They did it for the preacher. They did it for the church. They weren't sincere. I know young people can do that. But young person, let me remind you, you won't play games with God. He knows you. He knows your heart. 
you sit in a you sit at Moose Baptist Church on Sunday morning or whenever it may be, and I ask how many of you are born again, and you raise that hand, and there are some of you sitting here, and you know you're just as lost as can be. Don't play games with me. I've lived too long, and I've de I've dealt with young people too long. I know it's so. And there are some of you young people right now. It's got your mom and dad so fooled. They think you're so good and so nice. You live like the devil. By the way, teachers in our school, you know, you know sometimes we, we, I'm 50 something years old, 50, what is it, 51, something like, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, uh, I don't keep up with slogans the way I used to. I mean, when I was a teenager, I mean, I knew what was hip. I was hip. I've never been hip in my life. <laughs> But you know what? I look at things now. I don't know what they mean. The living dead or whatever you call them. And I was in the mall last night for my walk. And I took a double take. And this, this young man was walking toward me. He was black all over. And he wasn't a black guy. He's a white guy, folk. And had black under his eyes. And now for an older guy like me, I, I just go like this. I just shake my head and go on. But I guess he's hip, you know. But teachers, you better watch what some of our teenagers wear at school, what it means on their, on their shirts and so forth. It might not mean anything to us, but it means something to them. They know how to give a message. And some of the clothes that our teenagers wear today, now I know I'm hitting the road. The, this is where the rubber meets the road. This young man lacked one thing, and he, as far as we know, he never got saved. But he had a lot of people, people fool, but he didn't fool Jesus. And teenager in Noose Baptist Church, you will not fool him. Even though you might fool dad or your teachers, but you'll not fool him. The person who came, he had youth. He had wealth in verse 22. But you can't buy salvation. He had religion, but religion uh, will not take you to heaven. He had position, and there's no doubt about that. But position's not going to help you get to heaven. But then notice the problem he carried. The problem that he carried. No peace with God. No peace with God. Some of you will remember Mike Crane who came to be with us. He's the director of Fort Bluff Camp in Dayton, Tennessee. He has a very good camp there. And Mike and I are pretty good friends, but I've heard Mike give his testimony over and over again. When he was a young man, he was very popular. Athlete, and just very popular. But he said as popular as he was in his heart, there was a hole in his heart. He didn't have any peace with God. And he knew he was lost. And the only thing that would give him peace was salvation through Jesus Christ. Young man, young lady, older person, you may be here today, and you may have these things, but these things will not give you peace. And that's what this young man needed. He lacked faith in Jesus Christ. And when you don't have that, you don't have any peace. Now look at verses 17 through 21. And notice the man and his deception. First of all, the man and his desires. Now look at the man and his deceptions. Verse 17 again. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That's God. Thou knowest the commandment. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus beholding him, loved him. Let's stop right there just a second. Did you know today, I want to talk to you for a second. Did you know that today, if you're here in the building this morning, young or old, and you're lost, the Lord is beholding you right now? He knows you, but more than that, He loves you. Isn't that a great thought that God loves me? You know, there are people in the world who feel that no one loves them. That no one really cares. That's an awful thing. But there is, by the way, the most important one in the universe does love you. It's not very important if some people love you, but it's important if he loves you. 
and saith unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way and sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and take up your cross and follow me. Here's the young man and his deception. Now watch. He came to the right person. I'm going to give him credit for that. He came to Jesus. You know, some people will come to church and they'll come into the presence of the Lord, but they'll not take the right steps after that. They'll not do the right things after that. He came in the right way. He came running. I like to see that. I like to see people when they come to the Lord, they come running. They're, uh, they're, uh, they're after something. They're, uh, they're seeking something. He came for the right purpose. He wanted to talk about eternal life. Now think about eternal life. We've just completed one year, 2004. We're going into 2005. By the way, uh, if the Lord allows us to live through 2005, it'll be gone. It'll be gone just like that. But you know, when you look at it, it's quite a few days, isn't it, in a year. But think about eternity. Without end, and without end, and without end, and without end, and without end. And there's an interesting verse in the book of Revelation. It says, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Now if that's true and it is, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. If you reject the Lord, you're going to spend eternity with filthy, wicked, vile people. Do you think they're going to get any better? No, they'll get worse. He came at the right time because Jesus was near. Did you know that today's the right time because he's near? You're in a service. The word of God has been preached. God's people are here. And then notice the confrontation. The person of Jesus Christ dealt with him. But there was a problem. Now behind everything, of course, is sin. But he just had too many possessions. And then notice the clarification. Jesus said, sell what you have, give to the poor, take up your cross, and follow me. Did you notice that little phrase, take up your cross? Now in the framework of salvation, which is free, there is an element of repentance. Except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Man has to be willing to leave the things of the past, take a hold of a new life, and follow the Lord. And there is a cross. There is a cross to bear. And you remember Jesus even said to Peter, you know, you're going to have all of these things, but you'll have them with persecution. And there will be persecution for the child of God until the day that the Lord takes us home. Now you see what Jesus is doing? He's putting his finger right on the heart of the problem. Let's come to the third and last thing. Notice the man and his decision. Look at verse 21. Jesus beholding him loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying. And he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. He lacked one thing. He had great possessions. He wasn't willing to give those things up. Now, you know, with you, if you're here today and you're lost, it might not be great possessions that you're holding on to. You've heard the story of uh, Africa and the monkeys in Africa and how they catch monkeys in Africa. You've heard that story, how they'll put jars out in the jungle and they'll put these little nuts or little, little sweet things in the jar and a monkey will come by and stick his hand down in there and grab hold of these things and then the people will come by and catch them. And they could be free if they had just let loose of their little trinket. Just let loose of the little portion of food that they have and they could run away, but they keep clamping on to it. And that's the way it is with some sinners. There's something they're holding on to. 
something they're holding on to. The man and his decision, it was an earthly decision. He chose the possessions of this earth over treasures in heaven. Isn't that what Jesus said to Peter? You'll have treasures in heaven. Some of us may not have a lot here, but there's some people in this building that's got a lot over there. What a great thing it would be to know that they're there. Amen? Amen? But it was an eternal decision. As I've said several times before, there's no record that this young man ever got saved. I go back to uh, my freshman year at Tennessee Temple. I met a young man, and I'm not going to give you his name. I could give you his name, but I'm not going to do it. He came down to Tennessee from Ohio. And I met him, and we became friends immediately. And he had a car. I didn't have a car, and he had a car. And I would be preaching revivals in the area, and I didn't have a way to get there. And so he said, if you ever need a... He said, I don't care. If you ever need a ride, I'll take you every night. He said, that's what I want to do. I'll take you every night. And he would take me to, uh, to revival services, and I would preach, and he would bring me back to campus. And we did that almost the whole year, my freshman year. I can see him now. A good-looking young man, always dressed well, had a nice car, preparing for what he said God would have him to do. And in the course of our conversation, he talked about home and his job back home, a very lucrative position back home with his father. <coughs> he made a lot of money. I mean, he made a lot of money. He wasn't like a lot of us who were freshmen. His school bill was paid completely. He didn't have to worry about food. He didn't have to worry about clothes, gas, anything. Everything was paid for because he had a very lucrative position back home. Almost to the last day of the school year, he came to me one day and he said, I want to talk to you. He said, I won't be coming back next year. And I said, Frank, what, what's up? What's, what's going on? He said, I don't know what's wrong, but I've just got too used to the money. He said, I just can't, I just can't go on like this. He said, I just, I've got to go back to the money. He said, I could have a new car every year. And he said, I've got a fine bank account. And he said, you know, maybe someday I'll come back and finish up and go on and do what God has called me to do. But he said, uh, if I do, I'll let you know. About five years ago, I was looking at an old annual and I saw his picture. I knew the hometown that he lived in. And I looked up his number. I called the number and there was no, it was out, of course out of date. And I did some checking and to make a long story short, I found what happened. He's not on this earth anymore. He's gone. I don't know. I don't know the circumstances. I don't know anything that happened. I don't know. But I just go back to that day when he said, I'm not coming back next year. I love the money too much. To me, that's a sad story. But you know, there's an even sadder story, and it might happen this morning. You might be here, you might be just like this young man. You're looking for truth. You're, you're, you're looking for the answers, and, and you want eternal life. Well, you've come to the right place. And here's the truth. And today you can be saved. Because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Unsaved man, friend, trust them today. Christian, what about you? What about you? You going to go all the way with him? Or maybe like my friend, 
you'll go back to something and not follow on and serve the Lord. Would you stand in where you are with heads bowed and eyes closed? I'm going to